just pick your battles, know what's important to you and what hill you want to die on. Do I want to die on teenagers having messy bedrooms? Not really. Shut your door and bring the dishes down once in a while. You know, that's how low my standards are. I could almost trip over them. But you know what? Then I can make the headspace to be able to do other things that do matter, that do deserve my concern. You just got to pick what's right for you and prioritize. Hey, it's Renee. Welcome to the Into the Wild show, the podcast for women who want to build incredible mental strength to level up their business and lifestyle. I'm Renee Warren, the founder of We Wild Women, author, speaker, award-winning entrepreneur, and your host. Together, we will make you unapologetic about shining your light, growing your business, and turning you into a wildly confident and successful leader. This is for you, the visionary, the go-getter, the entrepreneur, and for those that need a real kick in the butt to get going and to dream bigger. Each week, I bring in leading experts and entrepreneurs to help you take leaps in the right direction because I know the best advice comes from someone who has successfully done it before. So are you ready to level up? Welcome to Into the Wild. Hey, you wild women. My next guest is a recovered lawyer, mom of six, and co-founder of Mabel's Labels. She is an award-winning entrepreneur, best-selling author, and sought-after speaker and MC. She is no stranger to the media, having appeared on NBC's The Today Show, HLN's Raising America, Breakfast Television, The Marilyn Dennis Show, CP24, among many others. Her articles have appeared in the Huffington Post, Today's Parent, The Globe and Mail, Profit Magazine, Working Mother Magazine, and numerous other websites. In this episode, Julie and I chat about what it takes to run a successful business and raise a family, and how to not be shy to ask for help. So please welcome the incredible Julie Cole. Thank you so much for having me, Renee. It was so great to hang out with you in real life, and it's equally as awesome to see and speak with you here. Yeah, it was so much fun. We went to Camp Tailwind together. We suffered together through the cold. <gasps> so cold. <laughs> it's so cold. That first night was killer. It's so funny because the first thing you said the next day, because Julie emceed this entire event, was like, I know you were all conniving on ways to escape this <laughs> island. I know I was. <laughs> like, how did you know? That's yeah. what I was thinking. We met really briefly, gosh, years ago. When I used to live and work in Toronto and you were speaking at an event at some little tiny cinema in the Bloor West Village. Oh my goodness. You are going way, 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 way back machine. Yeah. Well, when did you start your business? We're coming up to 20 years. What? Yeah, I know. So you were like in your first like little, probably five years of business. Then I think probably, it was probably 15 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that. It would have been before you had kids. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> the pre-times, the good old days. <laughs> yeah. No more kids, those? no kids, no boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. I had all the time in the world to do it. Sleep-ins, like, going like, out. No snacks, Your money no was your own. <laughs> so true. And my money. Wow. Anyway, those were fun. And then I just kind of followed your journey. And of course, I buy your product because it's amazing. It's my favorite labels. I even buy my own name in case I lose my stuff. Good idea. On all the things I, I put them all around our house. They're on all of the chargers. Everybody claims their chargers because chargers oh. go missing. You know, I've got six kids and most of them are teenagers. And my kids are even so bold because they have so many labels. Like if they buy themselves something special that they don't want to share and they do the Joey doesn't share food thing, they'll put like their label on their chocolate milk in the fridge. Because yeah. they can. That's what they <laughs> have to you do. you invented the company. <laughs> exactly. So you can freely print these things so that you can just throw them out the next day. They definitely have label privilege. <laughs> they do. <Yeah. laughs> so privileged in the label department. Well, good for them. So then I can't ask you if anything goes lost in your household because that would be funny. <laughs> You'd be surprised. What I find funny is I host a lot of parties because I have a lot of kids. Like, you know, one of the teenagers is having a big Halloween party. And then people leave things behind it. I always post, I'm like, you know whose house you're coming to and you bring unlabeled items along? Read the room, know your audience. Do you want to get invited back? (laughs) Like as part of the invite at the bottom, you should be like, P.S., label your stuff before you show up. 
Speaking of invitations, when my kids were little, I was pretty convinced that they got invited to birthday parties because the present was always like, I'd always make the Kim Mabel's labels. Of course. <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. That's the only reason why I'd invite you over anyway. Exactly. <laughs> Come over to bring some labels. <laughs> Love it. You're an incredible woman. Been in the business for a long time. Plethora of children. Big success. <laughs> So let's start off with some quick questions. I'd love to know, where are you from? Well, I'm actually living in the city I was born in, which is Burlington, Ontario. So just outside of Toronto. And of course, Mabel's Labels is our production facility and our offices are in Hamilton, Ontario. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I know Burlington. I have friends that live there. It's a cool yeah, spot. It's kind of suburban. It's got enough space when you need to raise six kids, right? I got a pool, I got a trampoline. I got a field, a dog, you know, all the things you need when you have a plethora of children. <laughs> a plethora of children. Yes, I love it. What was one of the toughest moments you had to face as an entrepreneur? There's been a few. I'm going to say a couple of things here. I'll answer quickly. I think in the early days, it was just not knowing the going to bed every night being, are we going to make a go of this? We felt like we would. We had some pretty good early feedback, but you put so much sweat equity into it. You know, I was up till 2 a.m. making labels and getting up at 6 a.m. with my three kids. I was pregnant with my fourth. So there was a lot of like, what if we put all this into it and it doesn't come to fruition? I remember driving by like closed down businesses. And for the first time in my life, I'd like start to cry and be like, oh my God, that poor entrepreneur, a small business owner, it brought a whole different empathy level, right? So I think that was the struggle in the early days. And of course, having left a career, so not having a J-O-B and, and giving up that salary. That's always a tricky thing to do. That was tough. I think also one of the other things was that as soon as we thought like we knew what we were doing, we would experience growth and changes would happen. So, you know, as they say, new level, new devil. So it was always having to learn and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which can be challenging. But it's also, I mean, that's the fun of entrepreneurship. Another big challenge, which was also a benefit, was working with four co-founders. It was amazing in the early days because we could divide and conquer. We had four brains at the table. We also had four people with opinions and feisty conversations. <laughs> and we managed it really, really well. And the benefits definitely outweighed the challenges, but it wasn't without challenges. And we always had to work at it to make sure we weren't siloing and protecting our own departments. So that was always a challenge for us. It was fun. Wow, I couldn't imagine four co-founders. Right? They, I know. I mean, it's hard enough with one. I mean, we went into it knowing each other really well. It was my sister and then two of our friends from university who ended up marrying my brother and my young uncle. So we were all related to, which also is another challenge when you're working with family because you need to make those decisions in the boardroom that maybe not all the partners find favorable. And then you have to say, are you bringing the potatoes for Thanksgiving tomorrow? And we all own a cottage together. So it'd be like, okay, so we'll see you at the cottage this weekend. So we had to make sure that we didn't take things personally, that we worked on our communication. When we didn't get it right, we reminded ourselves we were practicing. We'd do better next time. Wow. So I don't even want to ask, but I mean, I've worked with my husband to help him with PR in the early days of his startups. That was something else. Men have this way of just being like angry, upset in one moment, and then showing up as the husband or partner. And yeah. then like forgetting what just happened. And I'm like, do you remember what you just told me in the boardroom? Yeah, for sure. It is. It's hard not to carry that stuff out, right? Yeah. So what was yeah. the advantage, would you say, in having all of these, I guess, cooks in the kitchen? Well, right. Like, so again, those early days was one could be driving around, traveling, looking for material that would work for us. One could be like dealing with the bank and setting up, I could be writing a press release and trying to get PR. So, I mean, I really feel for my solo entrepreneur friends because they have to do it all, right? There's no divide and conquer. Everything falls on them. So I do feel like having four of us really contributed to our early, early growth. And the other thing too, I mean, we have what, six, seven, 13 kids between us. So we were having babies. So we could cover for each other and do that sort of thing. So we're all sort of in the same arena and we're able to support each other through what was going on personally as well. Wow, that's the thing. Like right now I'm doing this alone, but when I had my agency and had a co-founder and it was like, yo, I'm having a baby, like yeah. you up for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, do me a like, solid, right? Yeah, seriously, <laughs> do me a favor. Yeah. Okay, so what is one of your favorite quotes? I might give two. One is by Maya Angelou and it is, success is liking who you are, what you do and how you do it. 
And I think that's a really nice definition of success. It's not how many things you have on your wall, all your accolades. I think it is more internalized than that. And then the other one is by my grandma, Lyons, who died when she was 101 five years ago. I talk about her often. She was a real feminist. She was born to granny. She was one of 21 kids in Ireland. So she was an old Irish granny, but she was very much a feminist. When we won Women Entrepreneur of the Year at Mabel's Labels, she was in that limo. She was going down on the red carpet doing the thing. My girls, you know, like, so a real supporter, but also a big believer in humility. And what she would say is, Julie, you're as good as the rest of them and better than none. And I thought that was a great quote that I use often and share with my children because that's exactly right. We're as good as the rest and better than no one. So good on grandma for that. Yeah, way to go grandma. Keep us humble and keep us boosted all at the same time. I love that. So how old was she when she was coming down the red carpet with you? Oh, she was coming to things. Gosh, she was in her 90s. She did live to 101. Like she was really proud of us. And she was a supporter. I mean, she was the grand matriarch, right? She only lived to 101 because we took such good care of her. I mean, she, <laughs> she was in her home when she died. Like we did whatever grandma told us to. <laughs> what a beautiful family life though, to be able to create this family and surround yourself with such good values and energy that you can live this long. I know. It's an amazing value. It's an amazing core value. And I see it with my kids and we all rally around. Like I have an aunt with an intellectual disability. And we all take turns every Sunday. She goes out and she goes to the cottage with us. All the grandkids sign up and to take Ann Joan out. Like if mm-hmm. somebody's in a hospital, they're literally not left alone. Everybody signs up for shifts. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you adopt me, please? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, I know you only have six kids. What's one more? Yeah, what's one more? Right? <laughs> After a while, we just start taking care of each other. That's what I was told. Exactly. Communal living. My one friend, Shelly, has five kids and she homeschooled her kids. I think she still homeschools the younger ones. The older ones are like, three older ones I think are in high school now. And I met her in college and she had her plethora of children afterwards. And I kept looking at her Instagram and she's always like drinking coffee, reading a book or feet up on a lounger in the sunroom, swimming in her pool. I'm like, do you parent at all? She goes, no, no. You train the kids as young as they can to do the chores. And then you don't have to do anything. (laughs) And I'm like, that's the I did not get. Well, I will say there is some truth to that. When you have a big family, the kids really do have to take on some responsibilities and they have to be independent because you can't just do all the things for them. It's just not possible, right? So there are some benefits with that as well, but they're certainly doing a lot of parenting. (laughs) There's no hall pass for that, I can assure you. (laughs) This is great. This leads me to the question, how do you manage to raise six kids while starting and growing your company, Mabel's Labels? So I'm going to say there's a few things to that. One is that I'm not a perfectionist, so I can let things go. You know, I pick the hills I'm going to die on. I don't have a perfectly clean house. They don't get gorgeous meals every night. Their shirts are not going to be ironed. I really, really don't care what people think. Like you could come to my house and be like, it's a mess. I'm like, yeah, it is. So there is that. I think I've always said my perspective is my secret sauce. When you release how other people think or care how they perceive you, it it is so freeing to just live your life and be yourself and raise your family in the way that it needs to be raised, right? So there's that. Again, having kids like be fairly independent is helpful. They can take turns to make dinner. They can pack their own school lunches. From a very young age, they can be contributing to the household. I am a big natural consequence guy. So I had to be highly productive. So I couldn't chase my kids around and If they forgot their school lunch, they didn't get a school lunch that day because I could have spent my whole life chasing six kids around. They forget their lunches once. They never forget it again. It's not punishment. It's a natural consequence. Find a granola bar. Nobody said scurvy yet. Whatever. They only do it once. If you forget your gym clothes, you sit on the bench, you know? And I talk about this in my book about how important natural consequences are because I have to be productive too. So there's that. And I'm not afraid to ask for help. And people are like, well, just let me know what you need. I'm like, great, here you go. This Here's is what list. I need. <laughs> Here's the list. You know, when I would have a baby, I'm like, don't give me gifts, drop off meals, take out toddlers for a play date, drop my kids off at their sports. Like these are the things you can actually do for me. And I'm not shy about asking for help. I did finally get a nanny when my fifth kid turned one. And I often joke that I was three kids too late. So 
you know, if you've got a couple and you're trying to do this, get the help that you need it. Get somebody to clean your house. Get somebody to help with laundry. Do what you need to do to remain sane. And I know getting some clean your house can be expensive. If it's too much, just feed your kids more craft dinner. It's a priority, you know? <laughs> These are the things we have to do to get by. And I say no a lot. I say no to my kids. I have a whole 10 point checklist before I say yes to going to an event. Like I do these things. People have these great to do lists. I suggest having a do not do list. What are the things you're doing that you should not be doing? For instance, I don't unstack a dishwasher. There are things in the office I'm like, I'm just not going to do it. There are things with my volunteerism. I will sit on boards, I will MC events. Will I go to a gal and blow up balloons all day? No, that's not where my value is. So knowing your value and honoring your time and respecting your time will make your children do that and it will make your team do that and it'll make everybody do that. So it starts with you, mama. I love it. I have a dishcloth that says, pardon the mess, we're too busy making memories. I love it. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, I think a hundred years out, does anyone really care how clean your fridge was? I got this yesterday. The ultimate hell is that when you're on your deathbed and you end up meeting the person you could have become. Oh, that's so... Right, right? doesn't that hit? You're like, so no, the mess doesn't matter. No one cares. it really doesn't. Maybe some fancy person would care, but why invite them over? Always consider the source. Do you really care what they think? It's like if you get trolled on something, I'm like, who cares what they say? Are those your people that you care about their opinions? I think not. Don't let that get to you. You can delete them or yeah. you can apply by saying, no, well, you the got source. <laughs> no, the source. Always. And, and then there's societal pressure and like all these things. But here's what I'm noticing. And I see it, especially with all the women that we surrounded ourselves with at camp, is that all of these expectations of us, people are like literally raising the middle finger to them. Nope. Totally. Sorry. Doesn't serve me anymore. So yeah. bye. I am a big fan of the non dramatic exit. If you need to exit a friendship, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to block them on the Instagram. You don't have to have that big conversation. Just do the quiet exit. If any relationship's not working for you, just don't make it a thing. You don't have to announce that, oh, social media is driving me crazy now. It's getting too toxic. I'm going to take a break. Just go. We don't care. Like, yeah. just, you know, <laughs> don't make a thing of it. And I think that's the same with expectations. If it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to quietly not buy into that. And I'm just going to do my own thing. And I think more and more people, Renee, to your point, more women are kind of catching on to this and being like, "Mm, not today, Satan. (laughs) Not today. So when I heard that quote, I was like, wow, what are all the things I just need to let go of? And I just came up with this really awesome idea about like, if you want to have a tidy house, why not have a closet that's around on the floor in which most of the mess happens that you keep free? You can literally shove everything into if you're going to have guests over. <laughs> just close the door. Yeah, for That's sure. Crazy. And like, again, just pick your battles. Know what's important to you and what hill you want to die on. Do I want to die on teenagers having messy bedrooms? Not really. Shut your door and bring the dishes down once in a while. You know, that's how low my standards are. I could almost trip over them. But you know what? Then I can make the headspace to be able to do other things that do matter, that do deserve my concern. You just got to pick what's right for you and prioritize. So you want to grow your business, but you're stuck. Maybe it's your lack of organization or the sheer overwhelm of doing it all. Maybe it's because you have kids and you wonder how you'll be able to manage parenting and entrepreneuring. It's a good thing you're tuned in because if this is you, I have a solution. It's my private coaching. This program is designed to help female entrepreneurs get unstuck, inspired, and motivated to grow their dream business. All you have to do is go to wewildwomen.com forward slash coaching. That's www dot we wild women.com forward slash coaching and check it out when you click the button book a free discovery call you'll be prompted to schedule a really fun chat with me so i say do it best case scenario is we will make a plan to crush your business goals this year and i'd love to hang out with you so go ahead go to we wild women.com forward slash coaching what was the mental shift that needed to happen for you 
to be okay, other than the financial component of this, mm-hmm. to hire help? Okay, so certainly there's a financial component. There was also this mental component. So what happened was I was a lawyer. I'm a recovered lawyer. I had three babies. My oldest had just turned three. So it was busy anyway. I pack him in tight like you, mama. He had been diagnosed with autism. So at that time, had had the business idea and was like, look, there's a product missing from the market. Everybody's using masking tape and permanent marker. There's got to be something better out there. There wasn't. So we had the idea. And then when my son got his autism diagnosis, I was like, look, the traditional workforce is not going to sue me any longer. I need to advocate for this kid. I need to set up a program. I need to turn my basement into a therapy center, blah, blah, blah. And he already had a couple of younger siblings. So that's when I went to the girls and said, okay, what do you think? Is it time to start Mabel Sleep? Was really, let's do this thing. And I think this is something a lot of moms who are entrepreneurs, the hurdle you have to get over to pay for help is that in my mind, I'm like, I left the traditional workforce so that I could be with my family and do these things with them. Why would I get help with my family when I chose to stay home with them? It just doesn't make sense because you just can't do all the things. You just can't. And everything suffers. And then that's when the mom guilt comes in. And I always joke that I gave up mom guilt five kids ago. Like It's so not proactive. It's not helpful. So if you start feeling yourself moving in that mom guilt direction, you've got to just say, what do I need to do to fix this? You know, there are times where I do need to spend more time in the office. I need to work on my analytics. I need to perform. And then there's times where I'm like, wait, that kid needs a little bit more. Pay attention to your instincts. Pay attention to your gut. You know what the things in your life need and when to give them. You know, you're not going to give 50, 50, 50, 50 all the time. That's flexible. That shifts. You just have to be in charge of that. But that was my hurdle. I'm like, why would I get help if I stayed home to be with my kids? It almost felt like a failure or a I was getting it wrong. And then I was like, no, this is ridiculous. So don't make that mistake. I love that you said that. My husband went away. This was years ago when my boys were like two and three or three and four years old. He went away for two weeks. This was the first like longest stint that he'd been away. And I was running my agency and I had all the stuff, but I needed to advocate for myself in the value that I was providing for my kids to a family and for my husband to be able to freely go. And so I actually create an invoice for my entire two weeks of all the extras that I did in the parenting field. In two weeks, the invoice was $37,000. Oh my goodness. He goes, what is this? And I go, this is my hourly fee. And these are all the things that I did yes. that are beyond what I should be doing. And I know right. that's-, that's your do not do list. That's yeah. the stuff you can outsource because I'm like, I like to do stuff with my kids. Doing their laundry is not parenting. Yeah. They're two different skill sets, parenting and housekeeping. I don't know why it's like saying you should be a lawyer and a bookkeeper or like they're two yeah. completely different skill sets. Yeah, so $37,000, he thought he had to pay it. And I was like, no, no, no. But the reality is like, this is a value that somebody who is very capable of doing these roles could right. do. And I was so burnt out after that. And at a better price point. Again, know your value. Like for me, I've never baked a birthday cake. There are professionals who bake birthday cakes. And guess what? I'm going to make her kids labels. She's going to bake my kids' birthday cake. And then I'm going to hire somebody to clean my house and they're going to buy my labels. Let's all just do what we're good at and help you support this woman economy, shall we? Yeah, I love that. Exactly. So six kids, I'm still trying to digest this. Just the logistics. What kind of car do you have to drive? (laughs) So yeah, we had to upgrade uh, the fifth and then at the sixth. It ended up being, and I only just got rid of it because the youngest is 13. And we are away university now. So it does get easier for everybody with little ones. And they say bigger kids, bigger problems. Baloney, it's way easier. <laughs> like, <laughs> my tea's still hot. I actually <laughs> sit down and eat sometimes now. It was a Suburban. We drove okay. a Suburban. It was a nine-seater. There are a lot of logistics. We had to buy a bigger house when we had the sixth because we couldn't fit in the kitchen. So now I've got a big blown out house. We've got a huge harvest table because The other thing when you have lots of kids is there's lots of friends around all the time. You know, you become that house because a kid will come over and say, oh, is so-and-so home? No. Well, so-and-so home? No. Is so-and-so home? Oh, they'll do. I'll come in. (laughs) I'm sure you can relate with your boys being so close in age. Sometimes their friend groups are the same. Oh, yeah. You can imagine like when your boys are teenagers, it's just going to be one stinky big house. So yeah, there were those logistics. The thing is too, for me... And people always say, how do you do it? I can't manage it with two. And I'm like, you've done the hard part. One to do is the hard part. But honestly, I do have a high threshold for chaos. I can manage it. Noise doesn't bother me. 
mess doesn't bother me. I don't do me time. I'm okay not going and get my nails done. Like my idea of me time is different to a lot of people's me time. And I don't actually like the pressure that I feel that I need to have me time oh, because mine yeah. looks different. And I think we need to own that. Have you that. always been like that? Yeah. It's just different. Like I don't- Actually, I shared this on Instagram the other day and I said, really quickly, you're going to pull this out because it is actually like a perfect example of this. I go- Some people think you can't possibly be happy or enjoying life because you aren't doing it their way. They only see success through their lens of which they tell you what happiness is, but that's a fallacy. Happiness is self-defined and so is success. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so is that concept of having it all. You know, women are always, you have it all. I'm like, what does that look like? Good sex life, yoga, wine with the girls, couple kids, handsome husband, good job. Like all those things, I'm like, it's so gendered because men are never like, do you have it all? And I'm like, having it all is having what you want. I wanted to make labels in a basement and grow a company. I wanted to have six kids. Like there are things I can do to not have six kids, you know? Like this is not 1920. We can't let other people define what our me time is, what our having it all is. And I think once you own that, and then that whole comparison is the thief of joy. So I think honestly, like a big part of it was being able to just kind of understand how I love things and it doesn't have to be the same as everyone else. Yeah. Dan, my husband always has this masseuse that comes over because it's easier for them to come here. And I know when she's here because the basement heat is cranked to like a hundred degrees. Right. Even the dead of summer, which is fine. And he kept saying, you know, you should take time for yourself and go and get a massage and go and get a massage. It always triggered me. And now you just made me realize because that's not what I need for me time. Oh my gosh, Renee, literally. I'm telling you this quick story. Somebody bought me a gift certificate for a massage because they thought I needed one because I needed me time because I have a stressful life and I have all these babies and blah. I spent an hour on that table thinking about all the cool things I could have been doing instead. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes the thought of somebody else touching me during my me time. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. You were probably just like, they're a good intention, but- Yes, I mean, that was really nice. But again, it was other people projecting- onto us. Just because they love that doesn't mean we love that. If you do love it, take it. My goodness. All power to you. Everybody do their thing, right? Well, here's funny is like recording these episodes to me is me time because I've- Thank you. My people. And it's like going for coffee with the bestie. Every single conversation opens up some other level in my life and friendship. Oh, Renee, exactly. And like, Honestly, I am the same. To me, my work, a lot of time is me time. And for me, my work, and you might find the same thing. For me, I don't even know. And I know we have to make sure that we find balance and yada, yada, yada. But I do find that my work is more a lifestyle. You know, I'll MC a conference over the weekend. I don't feel like I need to take Monday and Tuesday off. I might be like, okay, I'm just going to make sure I'm home when the kids get home from school and not get back on my laptop till they go to bed or whatever, because I maybe didn't see them that weekend. But I can figure that out. And my kids have lived in this lifestyle long enough that they know how that works. It's a lifestyle. It tops up your love tank. Exactly. Yeah. And it's self-defined. It's like happiness yeah. and success. And we have like lots I, of different cups that need different filling at exactly. different times. That's okay. No it's not just, just the one cup. At least you have like a plethora of cups. I've got <laughs> many, many, many cups. <laughs> Too many cups. But the joy is in filling them when you feel the need to fill them doing what you want to do. Love that. Yeah. See, for me, me times CrossFit. And so people would be like, you're insane. That is stupid. I do yoga. And meanwhile, I'm like, that's boring. My mind would go crazy if I, I couldn't yoga. do yoga. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, get it. Not a yoga guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of chatter about the word imposter syndrome. I had a beautiful conversation with a lady yesterday, Tracy Litt, who wrote this whole blog post about how imposter syndrome is a fallacy. And I was like, mm-hmm. ooh, Okay. She brought so much light into understanding what it means and what it should mean or shouldn't mean. But I want to know, have you ever felt imposterish, if that's a word? I got to be honest. No, I don't. It really bothers me, particularly that women are feeling like imposters. And it just goes to show that we don't value ourselves. We feel like we're being fake when we succeed. Like we deserve this. I got good kids and a good business because I turn up every day for everything. I'm doing the work. And you do that over years. And I know sometimes people are like, oh, it's so nice. You wrote the book. You've got a successful business, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, 
yeah, but come on, I've been in line for a long time, mm-hmm. right? Like this does not happen. So no, I'll be very interested to listen to that podcast, Renee, because it's just not something that's really impacted me. Because when I'm not good at something, I'm like, I'm not good at that. I'm not faking that I'm good at it. Like I'm just actually not good at it. So I'll hire somebody. You know, I'm not good at IT. I'm not good at accounting. That's what we have professionals for. We hire to our gaps. Then the stuff we do well, let's do that well, right? So it's not something that I feel really applies to me. Maybe I'm just old. (laughs) Maybe that's it too. Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking, you know, have you read the book, The Big Leap? I haven't. It's on the list. Okay. Because she talks about working in your zone of genius. Right. right? Zone of excellent genius. And really what that means is, and if you're in your zone of genius, it's a flow state. You actually are happy doing the things that you're working on because it's, it's what you're good at and literally outsourcing for almost everything else. Yeah. It's like good to great. That was one of the early books we read in the business, right? It's like focus on what you do and don't get distracted. Distracted exactly. to do all the other things. I'm like, we make labels. When we're like, should we buy a facility? Should we rent a facility? I remember being like, well, if we buy a facility, then we're worrying about shoveling the snow and we're worrying about this. And what are we doing if we're worrying about that stuff? We're not making labels. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, really quickly about that too. So business for 20 years, is it just still labels or is there anything else that you've produced? Well, no, it's really, really labels. Like we do like now a clothing stamp, we have bottle bands, water bottle bands. So all sort of in that personalized space and we have safety products, allergy alerts, but we really have, again, when we've been like, oh, maybe we should start doing personalized this and personalized that we've kind of gone back to our, what is it that we do? I love that because I could see in this space how easy it would be to be all of a sudden manufacturing lunch boxes. I know. And I know. coffee cups. We've thought all. about it. We've yeah. thought about it, but then we're just like, but we've got what we do. We have a good business model. We know it. And we make a lot of money and we hire a lot of people and we love our community. I mean, we have 250,000 Facebook fans, 100,000 wow. Instagram followers, an active blogging community. We have so much fun. Don't fix what ain't broken. Exactly. And talk yeah. about focus. And you're really good at this no thing, obviously, because I feel mm-hmm. like maybe there was some Steve Jobs influence here where mm-hmm. he was just as happy of the things that he said no to. Yeah, and- right. Exactly. And I think, you know, in leadership, you have to be thinking about all of these things. 100%. I love it. Okay. One last question for you. When I ask you what it means to be a wild woman, what is that for you? Ooh, a (laughs) wild woman. I don't know. To me, it's about just embracing yourself. It's being everything you want to be, being your authentic self, not letting like all those outside influences impact your wild. And I think for me, it's always just been a little bit there. In fact, I remember my brother at our wedding, I'm doing a speech. He was saying how, you know, when Julie comes home, the phone's ringing, people just start turning up and bodies are on the floor in the basement because they've all had a big night. He always called me his little twister (laughs) because everywhere I went, there was a flurry of action. And that's probably my little bit of wild woman coming through. Yeah. (laughs) I just love action. I love people. I love community. That's just how I am. That's my wild. You are wild. I love it. (laughs) And I even have kind of wild hair today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's great. And that's you kind of. Yeah. Where can people go to find you online? Okay. So of course, check out MabelsLabels.com. But also for me specifically, MabelsLabels.com slash Julie Cole. And there you can even find my book, which is, I'd love you to check out. And I am, of course, on Instagram. I am Julie Cole Inc. on Instagram. I'm Mabel's Labels. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm in all the usual places you cool. can find people. Perfect. We'll we'll find you. We will find you. Please do. (laughs) Awesome, Julie. Well, it was so great having you today. Oh, thanks, Renee. It's so great to be with you. So there you have it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Into the Wild. To make this girl happy and to help reach other women who are dreaming of starting their business, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and everywhere you listen in. Also, If you want to find me in the wild, check me out on Instagram at Renee underscore Warren. That's R-E-N-E-E underscore W-A-R-R-E-N. And leaving you with one of my favorite tips of all time, the best advice you could ever receive is from someone who has successfully done it before you. 
Until next time, ladies, peace out. <laughs>